Um, a little bit about near-death experience, just so we can all come up to speed on this here. And again, I apologize. I know a great many of you are, are scholars and researchers in your own right. But just to be sure, if you're here and, 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 and less familiar with near-death experiences, not everybody who has a close brush with death has a near-death experience. It's only about 10 to 20 percent of people that do. Uh, 1982 Gallup uh, survey that was published indicated that about 5 percent of adults in the United States have had a near-death experience. These are not rare experiences. Uh, Near-death experiences can happen to children. They can happen to adults. Believe me, from people who've shared on my website, they happen to physicians and scientists, and we've heard from plenty of both. We had near-death experiences shared from priests, from ministers, from religious, uh, uh, and people, even people that are atheists, which is interesting. Um, hmm. I might make a brief aside here. If you don't mind me asking, if, is there anybody here who's an atheist? That would definitely affect what I have to say here, and it's really okay. I, we could, no, we... we, we I'm sorry? What's that? You don't believe in atheists? Oh, okay. There, yeah, go Kimberly. Hey, thanks. That was good. Okay, we don't have any atheists. Because I, um, I, I've given this, and it's been a little bit uh, controversial to some atheists, but I will tell you, right after my book came out, it, 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 my book and with evidence of the afterlife and that the reality of near-death experiences, uh, a number of atheists did take offense to it, and right after my book was published on Amazon, we had a few atheists uh, blast the book verbally, even though they'd obviously never read it. And I think some other people, I know uh, Dinesh D'Souza ran into the same thing, so watch out for that, authors. Uh, you know, atheists are, are very uh, opposed to the concept that there might be an afterlife of God and all those other things. And so the other thing that was interesting is what I, in one of our surveys, we asked the religious background at the time of their near-death experience. And we've had several dozen people, a few dozen, say that they were atheists at the time of their near-death experience. We asked the same question, what is your religious background now? Typically, in my study, an average of about 16 years after they had their near-death experience. Of the several dozen people that said they were atheists at the time of their near-death experience, by the time they shared it years later, only one said that they were still an atheist. So it seems that near-death experiences cure atheism. And I had one. That's uh, God, uh, one atheist tell me, Dr. Long, you make it sound like a disease. So I, that's why I'm, I checked on that. So apology. And it's, I don't shoot the messenger. I just, those are just the facts. But, you know, certainly the, prof and we'll get, as you see more about near-death experiences, you could see how hard it would be to maintain an atheistic viewpoint, especially if you've had a very profound near-death experience. Even those who have never heard of a near-death experience have typical near-death experiences. Prior knowledge of a near-death experience does not seem to modify in any way what happens during the experience. Well, the bottom line is, you absolutely cannot predict by any physiological prior belief system, demographic variable that I've seen, who will or will not have a near-death experience at the time of a life-threatening event. And among those who have a near-death experience, again, based on those same demographic backgrounds, uh, gender, prior belief system, religious beliefs, lack of religious beliefs, you really can't predict what the content of the near-death experience will be with any reliability. Bottom line, anyone, anyone in this room, anyone on Earth could potentially have a near-death experience, which is real interesting. Is definitely real. Hell is definitely real. I know you guys have probably heard a lot of near-death experience stories, but this one is the most legit. It's real. Very much real. See, he even says that it's very much real, so it must be true. It's not like those other people that just take drugs or hallucinate for some reason. You know, this guy went to hell and is coming back to tell you the story. It's not drugs. It's hell. Carl Knighton knows what hell is like because he says he went there after he accidentally overdosed on a drug called Valium. <sighs> okay, so maybe there were some drugs like Valium. I want to talk a little bit about what, what evidence there is for an afterlife because when you read books about it, it inevitably comes up that people purport there to be evidence. So I wanted you all to share your thoughts on that. One of the most common tropes is the, the near-death experience. Yeah. There have been, I think, um, over the last three decades, there's been 40 studies of some 3,400 near-death experiences and they've been published in journals like Lancet and, 
and um, Annals of uh, American Psychological Journals. And Barbara Haggerty did a, uh, a book on this called Fingerprints of God, where she interviewed a lot of the people who, who did these studies that were published in peer-reviewed journals. And a lot of the people she interviewed said that they cannot help but think, after investigating these in a scientific way, that they point to something beyond this life. I would say almost that was wrong by definition because it's a near-death experience. It means you didn't die. <laughs> but if, it's the um, best we have. No. If someone, if someone is reported dead on Tuesday and you see them on Friday, <laughs> <laughs> the overwhelming, well, not the, the obvious conclusion is that the initial report was mistaken. <laughs> We have no reason to think otherwise. I've read a lot about this stuff. I fact, I have two, if you care to get the portable atheist which I edited, there are two accounts by great philosophers, the late um, A.J. Ayer, and fortunately very current Daniel Dennett, about their own so-called near-death experiences, hospital experiences of people who were battling with very grave onslaughts on their health, which I recommend you read for the very confirming um, rationality that they bring to it. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who's a frequent um, debating partner of mine, has written a, a book about this too. And he, the most persuasive example from any hospital he's found, and I get it all the time, is a woman who floated out of her body, out of the bed, made a tour of the outside of the hospital, saw the shoe. noticed that there was a running shoe <laughs> on one of the window sills, woke up, reported it to a nurse, whose name we've never been told, and who went and looked, and there was the shoe. Now, if that doesn't prove it, I don't know what does. <laughs> I could hardly be re more reassured if I'd been told that it, that it was able to reunite it with its missing pair. <laughs> <laughs>
And then she told Kim Sharp the story of the old shoe. She felt like she was about three stories above the ground. And she is looking at a tennis shoe that's sitting on a ledge. She said the tennis shoe was dark blue, very worn, that there was a scruff place by the little toe, and that she saw the lace going under the heel. And the reason she was agitated, the reason that she wanted to see somebody is because she wanted someone to get the shoe. There was no shoe on the ledge outside of Maria's window, but Kim Sharp was curious enough to look further. So I start going from room to room to room, looking down on the ledges, so that I can go back to Maria and tell her that I have really done a thorough search. But on the opposite side of the hospital, on a different floor altogether, Kim Sharp saw something. I walked into one room, and I, I this is such a vivid memory for me, because I, I walked, I remember the window. I, I remember walking to the window, the window getting closer to me. The view was to the west. I had looked in many windows by this point and not seen anything. I looked down into my shock, my, my utter shock. <laughs> there was a tennis shoe. It was dark blue. It was beat up. Now, from my perspective, looking down, I couldn't see the little toe area. The little toe area was on the outside of the building, not towards the building at all. I could see the tip of uh, the lace coming out from under the heel I had to presume that someplace on the outside of the shoe, there was a continuum. That there was a lace that indeed went under the shoe in order for me to see what was coming out. I, I could not believe my eyes. I opened the window and reached down and plucked out the shoe. Maria's description of the shoe had been accurate to the last intricate detail, all the way down to the scuffed area of the left toe. There were no other buildings on that side of the hospital. Such details on the outer rim of the shoe could not be seen from anywhere on the ground or from anywhere inside the hospital. <laughs> 